If you're hosting your ASP.NET Core application using Kestrel, then there's a lot of things that Kestrel can't do. The recommended configuration is to run with a different web server in front of it, something like IIS, or, if you're on a different platform, Nginx. Let's mash on that. Hi everybody and welcome to the ASP.NET Monsters. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Nginx. Uh, so Nginx is a very fast, very configurable web server uh, which comes in free and paid varieties and runs on pretty much every flavor of Linux and Unix and also on Windows. Uh, so by default, if you're running on ASP, or if you're running ASP.NET Core on something like OS X, which I'm doing right here, uh, you're gonna do your web serving through a tool called Kestrel. So this is a, a libuv based web server, but it's a very lightweight web server. So it's missing a lot of functionality like uh, gzipping and SSL termination, uh, things like that, that you might ex have come to expect from a platform like- uh, Multiple IAM. hosts and right, multiple hosts and port bindings. Right, so uh, the recommended solution is to run something else in front of it. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at Nginx today. Uh, so let's start off by uh, heading over here and I have got here just a standard ASP.NET core application here. Uh, so you'll recognize this sort of configuration here. This is the, the default one and I created this just using Gilman. Uh, so let's boot this up, .NET run. So this is invoking the the run command that's exported as part of the project. This is going to be running on Kestrel. That's right. Uh, so I don't think it actually lists Kestrel anywhere here. And uh, let's just background this process here real quick. Uh, if you take a look at something like um, the project.json, uh, then you can see that we're, we're running using server Kestrel here. Well, this is one of the packages that gets installed. Uh, okay, so we had that running here. I'll just foreground that process again here. And that was running on localhost 5000. So let's go and just load that up so we can be confident that it does work. This initial load just takes a little bit of time, jitting and all that. So there we go. Uh, this is just Looks familiar. Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. Very much the default template. And not creative enough to create a new one here. Uh, so this is the, the log file from all of it here. A uh, little bit of information in here. You can see the files that are being served out and everything here. Uh, so let's go and throw Nginx in front of that. Uh, so I'll just run through the, the Nginx configuration file here really quickly, and then we will boot it on up and take a look at it here. Uh, so this is kind of a, a weirdly syntaxed file here. It's not quite JSON. Um, it's kind of like JSON without colons. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a custom implementation, like somewhere, I think we've said before, it's somewhere between, it looks like it's somewhere between JSON and YAML. Yep, something like that. Uh, so we start off with a number of worker processes here. So this is just like the number of, workers to run inside Nginx. Uh, that's not necessarily the number of things that you're serving at a time because there is uh, like a, a queue, like you would have an IIS here. And in this case, we set it to 1024. Uh, inside the HTTP server block here, uh, I say HTTP server block because it's actually possible to have Nginx serve a bunch of different stuff out. Uh, so Nginx will serve out uh, FTP stuff as well, uh, and possibly some other stuff too that I can't I think of off the top of my head here. Uh, I'm including a selection of MIME types here. So this is the stuff that you, you've seen before in uh, IIS where you're just saying that like, hey, if you're serving out something like .json, then you can serve that out as, uh, what is it, application slash JavaScript. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that just appears in this MIME type file here. I can just load it up for you and see how exciting it is. 
so that token gets replaced in line where that's where line 12 is there include mime.types that that token just gets replaced and all those mime types get loaded into that http section yeah i, I guess so um i don't think it, it doesn't i just as yes. it's loading yes. or processing yeah, that, or parsing right. or whatever yeah that, that's yeah. exactly how it works uh, so you can include like additional files inside of this configuration if you want to just include bits and pieces from other stuff uh, so that works out quite nicely. Uh, I'm just setting the default type here to an octet stream. Uh, next, I'm setting up the logging here. So this is just kind of the format for the log file, how that should appear, and where the access log should be. Uh, you notice that I'm using a full path here. Uh, I had some trouble setting up Nginx using relative paths here, so I ended up using fully qualified paths. I don't know if that's just an artifact of the way that I installed it or if that's an Nginx sort of thing. Uh, next, I am enabling send file. So send file is a system call that appears on most Unixy platforms that allows sending a file directly over a TCP socket. So you don't have to worry about buffering or anything like that, and it makes everything a little bit quicker. Uh, I'm giving it a, a timeout here. This is how long we'll allow connections to stay alive on the server before we terminate them if there hasn't been any sort of keep alive received for them. Uh, this sets up a proxy cache location. We'll get into that in a little bit here, so just ignore that for now. Uh, and then we're going to set up the, the server proper. So right now I'm just listening on port 8080, and I'm just going to listen on plain HTTP. If you're looking to, to listen using SSL, you can put like SSL in here. Uh, if you're looking to listen with HTTP2, you can do HTTP2 in here, and that will enable HTTP2. Uh, which is something that, as far as I know, Kestrel does not support. So this is a nice to have a, a proxy in front of Kestrel for that. Uh, this is a server name that we're going to listen on. Localhost is a good plan right here. Uh, and we're going to set up a couple of kind of like, I guess this, these would be almost the equivalent of sites inside IIS. So the first one is that anything that has slash static in the URL. I would like to serve from these static files that I have located in this directory here. Uh, for image files, I'm going to serve them out from slash images, and I'm going to use this proxy pass command here to pass this through to Kestrel. Uh, I've commented out some lines here. We'll get back to those in a minute. Uh, and by default, I'm just going to have anything here that goes to slash pass it on to uh, our Kestrel server. So the, there's no reason that you can only have rules like this. Uh, you can add additional rules in here if you want to. So if I had like additional stuff in here, so maybe I was serving um, users here and I had a, a microservice that was dealing with users and this would pass anything from users onto this URL. And then somewhere else I have like another thing here that is um, accounts. Uh, and so this allows you to have multiple kind of microservices listening on different ports here. And you kind of use Kestrel to, to proxy stuff through to each one of those. So that saves you having to, to write some sort of crazy application that's just like an endpoint for other parts of your application for other microservices. Let's go right on. Get rid of that. Okay, so. This is standard configuration, and if I hop over here to a terminal, I already have this Nginx running, so it uh, demonizes itself by default here, and I can just have it reload its configuration here by just doing dash s reload. Uh, it probably listens in on like kill signals as well. I haven't given that a try, but it should give us something listening on localhost at port 8080. Let's give that a try. And there we go. So it's the same application here, and this information is just being passed straight through to our Kestrel server, which gives us the same now sort you, of thing. You can't hear it right now during the recording, but everyone at home is giving you a round of applause, Simon. That yeah, was awesome. I, I think it's super <laughs> awesome. So let's take a look at our, our Kestrel server here and see what sort of things it's doing and not doing for us. I'm going to reload the site here. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out right off the bat is that the initial HTTP get for like the HTML page here, uh, its content encoding is nothing. Uh, if we take a look at some other stuff here, I'm just going to reload this without cache so you can see what happens for some other files here. Uh, so you can see this is coming in from the ASP.NET CDN, and it's being gzipped. 
So that's super nice because it makes it a lot smaller here. So this request starts out at 118 kilobytes, but by the time GZIP has dealt with it, we're down to 27.7 kilobytes, which is smaller. Indeed it is. And therefore better. So Nginx in its default configuration is going to do the same thing that Kestrel does, which is not gzip our local host. So let's go and ask Kestrel to do that for us, or rather Nginx to do that for us here. So if we go in here, and I feel like I've foolishly screwed up my undo stack that had this information in it. Uh, I think it was at the HTTP level. Let's try this, gzip on, give that a try. Let's go reload and see. It didn't complain, so hopefully I put that in the right place. Let me go here and do a hard reload. Oh, that looked good. So now localhost is being served out using gzip here. Uh, so you can see that the size has gone down from 8.3 kilobytes to a poultry 2.6 kilobytes. So right off the yeah, bat, that's awesome. That's fantastic. It, it, yeah, like four, or a quarter of the size or a third of the size. Um, and I mean, when you think about when you're paying for egress and things like that on in a host facility and you've got massive volume and you've got something more than the default template going on, there's going to be a lot more HTML bytes that you want compressed and saving dollars and saving bandwidth and getting a mobile and things like that. So there's lots of good reasons to do that. Absolutely. So I think that's fabulous. Uh, one of the things that Nginx does is it allows you to do some caching. Uh, so I kind of purposefully skipped over this section before here, but uh, this is going to set up the caching path for our proxy uh, and also a temporary path. This is stuff that's going to disappear quickly, and then the temp cache is something that's going to hang around a little bit longer here. So I've set up a few bits here. So this is a, like the name of the cache, basically. Uh, it expires, it, its size is 8 megabytes. Its maximum size is going to be 1,000 megabytes. And don't be confused here, even though it's using the same unit. This M stands for minutes, so this will time out after 600 minutes or 10 hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn on this proxy caching stuff here for the images directory here. So I'm going to cache any 200 HTTP response or any 302 HTTP response for 60 minutes. And I'm going to cache any 400s for one minute. So it means that if there's a file that was missing, but gets added, it's only going to be missing for a minute. Uh, so let's go and uh, do a restart of that. So that's going to cache these on onto the disk then? That's right. So I'll put some spaces in here, and this should be the initial load, so we should have a mandatory cache miss on these, so we're still going to see those SVG images get loaded. Unless they happen to be cached inside of the browser, which they are. Thank you, caching. So let's go and just do a hard reload on that. So now if we come over here, we should see some of these SVG images, hopefully. I don't see them even getting called here, so... They may have been cached from a previous run yes, here. Yes, it's possible that that is the case here. Uh, so, so the caching is working. Yes. So there are no um, requests for scalable vector graphics. So if we scroll like way back up here in history, we can see oh, that they, are. they were being requested on every call before, and now they're not being requested. So that allows us to offload some of the load from Kestrel into Nginx, which is probably going to be a little bit faster than the way that Kestrel handles things. So some of these features we could do as middleware within our ASP.NET Core app. Absolutely. Uh, What's, what's the advantage then of doing this? In, uh, in so there's, there's a couple of possible advantages. Uh, one is that it's probably going to be faster to run through Nginx than it is to run through any sort of Kestrel. There's less stack to get through to serve like a static file out if you're going through Nginx than if you're going through Kestrel because that now has to move down to like ASP.NET and hit the middleware to serve out the static files and those sorts of things. So no matter how fast ASP.NET is, it's unlikely to be as fast as like a bunch of compiled C code, which is behind Nginx. Right. So in uh, theory, it should be a little faster. I guess another advantage might be that it it kind of simplifies your the request pipeline for your ASP.NET Core app, so yep. you're only doing application things in there. Absolutely. Should make it easier to debug, although it, 
<laughs> it does get a little tricky sometimes, right, when you're bouncing between where is this request being served and how is it being handled. Run into that just on the IIS side of things with, you know, is it a request handler that's intercepting it before it gets to ASP.NET? And it can get a little confusing. At yeah, times. that can be a little bit tricky. Um, but the nice thing about Nginx is it's very quick and easy to turn that kind of stuff off. Uh, right. So you could just go in and kind of remove that proxy stuff very quickly from the config file and know where stuff is being served from. Uh, another possible advantage is that you could serve your kind of static content files out from a cheaper server. So if you're running something that runs on full .NET framework and you have no option other than to, to run it on an expensive Windows machine, then you might not want to use that expensive Windows machine for serving out static resources. So you could have Nginx running on a cheaper Linux machine in front of it and just have it proxy requests that need to go through through and anything that's a static file you could just serve out from there. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Nginx. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's definitely something that you would use on kind of Linux and Unix platforms more than you'd use on Windows. Uh, IIS on Windows is probably still the best option for, for doing hosting. Right. Well, that makes sense. Excellent. I have, to, I have to try to retrain myself, though, because I keep calling it Nginx, and I just can't stop for some reason. <laughs> I went to the Wikipedia page to make sure that my pronunciation was correct. And the, uh, the pedants who edit Wikipedia have confirmed that it is, in fact, Nginx. Very well, then. I have been wrong for a very long time. <laughs> it's not the first time, though. It likely won't be the last. Well, thanks everyone for joining us again here on ASP.NET Monsters. Remember to like, comment, and share, and send us an email with your comments and questions. Great, thanks everybody. Thanks a lot, everyone. Cheers.